Hi everybody. As a diplomat, I have served both in developed and developing countries. While serving in the developing countries, I came to know how much people are interested in Korea's socio-economic development. That's why I have started my lecture series on Korea's development and its unique experiences. I'm not either an economist or a development expert, but I have lived with Korea's economic growth and witness the process with special concern and care. So I thought perhaps I would have something to say about Korea's economic development on my own. How Korea was able to develop so rapidly and steadily is it really possible for a poor country with mere $80 of per capita income to run through a sea change and become a country with $24,000 of PCI in just 50 years? Well, the answer is yes and it actually happened in South Korea. Then what were the main factors for this miracle and how did they work in the process? This is not easy to answer because the process was long and complicated. In particular, the success of the process is entirely owed to the hard work and dedication of the people of Korea. That's why I like to call the development of Korea People's Economic Revolution. And I think this process is not yet over. The challenge is still going on, and the Koreans seem to enjoy the ever-emerging challenges before them. If I'm asked to name only three main elements of development, I would like to point out the leading role of the government, the audacious entrepreneurship of the private sector, and dedicated support of the general people. Why? First of all, it is obvious that the government took the initiative of developmental process in the beginning. Luckily, we had an insightful and determined leadership to pursue the goal despite the enormous difficulties and there were tasteful and hardworking policymakers and government officials. The government was nimble and efficient to design new policies, prepare solid ground for implementing them, and fulfill the goals and objectives of the plans thoroughly. The role of the government has changed according to the paces of the development, but it has remained a key force throughout the process of development. Secondly, I cannot miss out the all-out efforts of entrepreneurs in building businesses, developing new technologies, and creating jobs. They used to be the faithful followers of government policies and guidelines. However, they were not simple mechanical followers. They were creative, persistent, and audacious people. In Korea, people are still talking about legendary businessmen such as Jeong Joo Young, Lee Byung Chul, Kim Woo Jung, Park Tae Jun, and others. These are the founders of now well-known companies like Hyundai, Samsung, Daewoo, and Bosco. Without unprecedented insight, vision, and brave act of the great businessmen, Korea may look different today. Not only the big names, but innumerable small names in the business circle play their roles to achieve what they wanted. Thirdly, throughout the process of economic development, unity and cohesion of the general people were conspicuous. Without spontaneous contribution, dedication, and active cooperation and support of the ordinary people, the long journey toward economic affluence might have been interrupted on the way. For example, our parent generation has sacrificed themselves for the better future of their children. The well-known spiritual movement, Semar Undo, was an epitome of cohesion and unity of the Korean people. With the motto of self-help and self-sufficiency, the people in the rural area were united in their common efforts to transform their villages. Farmers worked hard voluntarily from morning to evening. In this way, Semar Rundong has played an important role for modernizing the rural area. In my presentation, I will touch upon five main themes in details. These are the concrete role of the government in the growth of the economy, industrial development and its effect, international economic policy, territorial development policy, and Korea's social policy. Through this presentation, you will get to know the panoramic process of Korea's economic growth, brave approaches, brilliant successes, 
and mistakes and errors as well. Korea's main engine of growth was export. In order to grow steadily, Korea needed expansion of bilateral trade, both export and import. This has been largely achieved by concluding numerous free trade agreements. Korea has so far concluded FTA with 49 countries. Owing to ever-expanding FTAs, though Korea stands 109th in terms of the territorial size, its FTA economic territory stands third in the world. It is logically convincing that a small and resources poor country like Korea must rely on expansion of trade in order to grow economically. Based on this simple logic, Korea has adopted export-oriented economy and succeeded. Export promotion alone was not enough for Korea to become a global player. Korea's economic structure, particularly the financial sector, was weak and loopholed despite its brilliant economic performances. The momentum came in 1997 when the Asian economic crisis landed on the Korean Peninsula. With that tsunami, Korea was cornered almost to the verge of default. Korea had to appeal for the bailout of the IMF. That's why Koreans call this the IMF crisis. Faced with the crisis, Korea underwent painful reform of its economic structure. Though the reform was painful, it brought eventually blessing to Korea because her economic fundamentals became stronger and healthier. When the world was engulfed by financial crisis in 2008, Korea was one of those countries that were able to overcome the crisis with relative ease and peace. In a small but crowded country like Korea, the land was always the controversial issue because the land was simply so precious. Everybody wanted to own an upland, but it was nothing but a dream for most of the people. While Korea was active in transformation, the government faced the tough task of how to manage the limited land efficiently and how to ensure the best use of it. Faced with this formidable challenge, the government did its best to come up with the wise land policy because it knew too well that the best use of the land is vital to the economy. In my presentation, we will have a look at many sides of Korea's land policy, the success stories and mistakes and failures as well. In order for a nation to attain a sustainable development, it needs to bring balanced improvements in many areas, including politics and economy. Korea has done this. Koreans are quite proud of themselves that they were able to attain democracy and pluralism as well as the economic progress in just half a century. In explaining Korea's social policy and its achievement, I would focus on the education and rising power of women in the Korean society. No doubt, education was the backbone of Korea's development. In the 1950s, Korea's illiteracy rate stood at 80%, but now almost zero. Moreover, Korea has become a country where more than 80% of the high school graduates go to the colleges. What has driven Koreans so desperately to education? How did it happen and what was the result? These are the questions that I'm going to answer at my presentation. In February 2013, Park Geun-hye government was inaugurated. Madam Park is the first woman president in the history of Korea. Madam Park's victory in the election and her strong leadership as the president are the epitome of the rising power of women in Korea. Korean women are conspicuous in their performances and capabilities and extending their presence in whatever the fields of society. There is no taboo area for women anymore in Korea. I will show you how rapidly women's status is rising and how importantly their roles are growing in every work of the society. The last subject that I'm going to touch upon is the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. There are still pros and cons on this issue, and it is likely that perhaps the argument will continue until reunification actually takes place. But I believe unification is a matter of no choice for the Korean people. It will come one day, and Koreans must be prepared for that. What unification emerges is more important for the Koreans. It's due to its implications on Korea's economic development. 
Though unification will pose a tough challenge on the Koreans on account of the huge spending, so-called unification cost, presumably trillions of dollars, it will give the Koreans unprecedented opportunities for leaping forward economically once again. Why is it that? What actually will happen to the Korean Peninsula? What are the real implications of unification for the people of both South and North Korea? I will try to share my views on these questions with you. I hope this brief introduction will help you understand the basics of Korea's socio-economic development. I also hope that the outline information on my presentation plan would be useful for you to consider whether or not I will be the right person to talk about this issue. Thank you very much for watching. See you again.